Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I have to say, Dr. Frank has a lot more better patient with interaction because not many people kiss me. Okay. Well, um, I already already has had a very good relationship with the program, and then I would like to congratulate you for the program's accomplishments already. And it is a rather uh, young program, but it has helped so many people and many of my patients as well. So thank you. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, minimally invasive urological surgeries. So we are going to talk about two uh, urological organs. So first, I'm going to talk about prostate. And uh, since we don't have a lot of time, we're not going to talk too much about the kidney. Over the prostate, we're going to talk about two conditions. One is a benign prostate hyperplasia, which is a very common condition for aging men. Women don't have prostate, so women don't have to worry about this. So there are two different ways that we can approach surgically. We'll go into uh, a little bit more detail soon. And secondly, we are, I'm going to talk a little bit about prostate cancer, which is very common. It is the for most common non-skin cancer in, in U.S. men, and especially it's more common in African-American men, and they tend to have more advanced stage and more aggressive form of cancer at the time of detection. And so the radical prostatectomy has become the number one treatment option for the localized prostate cancer, and the robotic prostatectomy now accounts for about 80% of cancer surgeries for prostate cancer nowadays. So we'll go into that a little bit. So since it's uh, a little bit of educational event too, so I wanted to give you a little bit of anatomy lesson. So the kidney filters blood and then produces urine, and then the toxic substance or the substance will be, uh, you know, passed down from the kidney through a tube called ureter, and it gets collected in the bladder. Here. And then the acid urine gets collected here, and then when it's time to void in man, the man's bladder will squeeze, and the urine will pass through the tube called urethra, and it comes out in the male genitalia. And this urethra passes through the prostate, so you can think of the prostate somewhat surrounding the urethra. So you can think of it, if the prostate gets bigger and bigger and bigger here, then you will squeeze the urethra. And then as a result, man will have a hard time voiding. So there are many treatment options. So one way will be the medical therapy. You can either relax the smooth muscle in the prostate or shrink the size of the prostate gland. But the other way, if the medication do not work, then you have to consider uh, surgical options. And one of them is the, what we call transurethral. So after the man is put to sleep, then we put a metal tube with all the instruments, with the scope, as well as uh, some other instrument to pass through the urethra and get to the prostate. So we are looking inside of the prostate and then make the hole bigger and bigger inside of the prostate by either vaporizing or cutting. And one of the most common way that we used to do is called transurethral resection of the prostate gland. And nowadays we are using laser. So you can see uh, this view here, you can see the prostate from inside. The view is fairly limited, although we have a very modern uh, fiber optic instruments, but still the view is pretty small. And then you can deal with the prostate up to 30, 40, even 50 gram prostate. So if your prostate is slightly enlarged, medication does not work, this is perfect option. But what if the prostate gets even bigger? So a prostate that is bigger than 75 grams or so that we used to, we still do, uh, what's called a simple prostatectomy. What that means is that we leave the capsule or the shell of the prostate behind, but core out what's inside. And we used to do this operation in open fashion. We used to make an incision about this long, and then in the lower abdomen, and then try to core out prostate. And that can be rather bloody. And so it's not really the safest thing for people who choose not to receive any transfusion. Then the robotic surgery came about. So it's, uh, we started doing robotic simple prostatectomy for men who have a very enlarged prostate gland. I told you briefly just now that average prostate for normal people is about 30, 40, 50 grams. And we do this operation for patients who with uh, most of the time, uh, more than 100 grams. The biggest one we have taken out is 280 grams. 
So um, then you can say, well, and then as a result of using the robot and laparoscopic approach, that we really do not need a lot of transfusion anymore. And is that because the robot has better hand than the surgeon? And the answer is no. The, why we don't need a lot of transfusion or less blood loss is this, this no. So this is the very beginning of the laparoscopic approach. What we do is we stick a needle into the abdomen and we inject carbon dioxide gas. So we call it pneumoperitoneal. What that means is that you're continuously injecting the carbon dioxide gas and your abdomen becomes somewhat of a pressurized chamber. So if you make a small cut into the either capillary blood vessels or venous blood vessel, though you don't see a lot of blood. Even arterial vessels, you don't really bleed a lot compared to the open surgery. This really revolutionized how we do the operation. The blood loss has gone down significantly, and then also the transfusion rate has gone down significantly. Dr. Frank will talk about that as well. So that was the brief introduction and uh, overview of the uh, benign prostate hyperplasia. And next, I want to talk to you briefly about the prostate cancer. And we're going back to the anatomy lesson. So you have uh, this person with the head on the right and the leg on the left. And you have the bladder. Once again, the bladder holds the urine. And then the urethra passed through the prostate and out. And so here's the prostate. But outside of the prostate gland, you have a lot of structures. So here, you can see the arrow here, right? OK. So here, you have a muscle. And those are sphincter muscles. So you can think of it as a valve. So if you want to stop them for men and women, if you want to stop the flow in the middle of your urination, that's the muscle you are contracting. And also, you, uh, a lot of women know this Kegel exercises. This is what you are exercising. So you are doing that. So you want to make sure that you don't injure that. And you have some very important nerve structures that are right outside of the prostate gland. And they are responsible for erection. Not such sensation, but erection for men. And you also have this thing called dorsal vein of penis. So it's a vein, it looks like a fairly benign procedure, but it comes right outside and right in front of the prostate gland. So in men, a normal man, we have about five liters of blood. And if you try to remove the prostate gland, this dorsal vein has to be controlled or else you can have a catastrophic bleeding. So briefly talk about, I want to talk about the history of radical prostatectomy. So Radical means the whole thing. The, we briefly, uh, a little bit earlier, we talked about simple prostatectomy. That is uh, for the benign prostate hyperplasia and leaving the shell of the uh, prostate behind and just coring it out. If you are doing a surgery for prostate cancer, you want to take the whole prostate out, including the shell. So that is called the radical prostatectomy. So the first radical prostatectomy was for prostate cancer was done at Johns Hopkins in 1904 by a guy named uh, Dr. Hugh Hampton Young. He was our very first chairman of our department, and he was a chairman for 30 plus years. I mean, he was a remarkable man. But anyway, so he developed a procedure called radical perineal prostatectomy. So radical means the whole thing, prostatectomy, removing the prostate gland, and perineal means perineum. So it's an area between the man's scrotum and anus. So green is the prostate. To get to the prostate, you try to get either this way, which is a radical perineal, or you can do the retropubic. So retro means behind, pubic means pubic bone. So to get to the prostate, you are going behind the pubic bone, push down the bladder, and get to the prostate to remove the prostate gland. So radical prostatectomy, though, had a problem. So one of the devastating side effects was life-threatening bleeding with the radical retropubic prostatectomy. So you can look at this prostate on the side view again. So here's the prostate, bladder here, and you have a dorsal vein of penis. And that comes right outside of penis and also drains the other pelvic uh, structures and then goes on top of the prostate gland. So I briefly told you that you can, you have about uh, five liters of blood in normal man. And if you cut this dorsal vein without suturing, it depends on the person, but uh, I have seen people lose one to two liters of blood. So it's 20 to 40% of your blood in a couple of minutes. And you can see this thing, and blood comes out. 
And so that was a very, very dangerous operation. Until uh, 1982, Dr. Patrick Walsh, who was the chairman at Johns Hopkins, came up with a new way of doing the operation called anatomical radical retropubic prostatectomy. He figured out that there was a vein is there, and he figured out the way to control the blood vessels at that time. So as a result of that, and the radical prostatectomy has become very, very popular. <coughs> but even then, still the bleeding was an issue. So I remember when I was in training, I was trained by Dr. Walsh when I was a resident that we used to get blood units uh, reserved for the patients for the following day's operation. As an intern or resident, you run around the hospital trying to make sure that everything will go well the following day, and then we used to have one or two units of blood ready for the patient, or ask the patients to donate their autologous blood ready so that they can donate their own blood, have it set aside so that they can receive it during the time of the operation or following the operation. And that changed again. So robot came about, and, and, and along with the laparoscopic approach, once again, in supplementation with the carbon dioxide or the pneumoperitoneum, decreased the blood transfusion significantly. So that doctor, I remember the time when Dr. Frank came to our grand rounds not too long ago, and he said, you guys, urologists, you guys are wasting our resources. <laughs> and he said, you, you don't really need to get uh, blood set aside anymore for the robotic prostate surgeries anymore. So we used to set aside two units for the open prostate operations. Now we don't even type in screen anymore. So uh, that has been a huge, huge change for us. So that's it. So I, will, I told you about the benign prostate hyperplasia and how to manage that, and prostate cancer and how to manage that. And because of the uh, new surgical uh, approach as well as the help from the Center for Bloodless Medicine and Surgery that we can address the need for a lot of patients who do not want to or who cannot receive transfusion. I want to thank you for your attention. We should have uh, about five minutes for questions after every speaker. And while you're thinking of questions for Dr. Han, uh, I will say that uh, I keep the transfusion database at Hopkins, so I ranked all the surgeries on a scale from the, the most likely to the least likely to require a transfusion. And uh, when you look at the robotic uh, prostate surgery, we have transfused one patient in the last thousand uh, procedures that we've done. And that particular patient was anemic to start with. So the chances of bleeding with the robotic surgery are close to zero, and the chances of transfusion are close to zero. So this is really a revolution in, in the way we do surgery. Uh, at first we didn't like the robot, it was too cumbersome and it took longer, but now it's the way to go. So if anybody has any questions about urology or robotic surgery, we're open for questions. Is the purpose of the gas to pressurize the abdomen, the area there, or does it freeze it, or what's the purpose so of it? So it's a, a room temperature gas, and then it's it to expand the area so that we have a bigger area to work around. And uh, because the robot uh, has a magnified view, so when, uh, for the surgeon, we always talk about the field, and we would like to have a good surgical field, and we would like to move around. And from the open surgery to go to the robot, you feel like you're working in a, such a huge area uh, because everything is magnified you, and then you have a bigger area because the abdomen is distended. So. In my mind, I'm looking at this from the anesthesia perspective on the other side of the drapes. Uh, it looks like the, the air they put in the abdomen pushes all the other organs out of the way so, so they get better exposure. I think that's what Misap said. Um, so thank you, Misap, for being here. And, uh,